Hi, everyone. Um, unfortunately, it's not Amanda. She is still unwell. She doesn't have a voice. Um, so I'm Chrissy Elmer, and I'm the Science and Technology Program Manag Manager at Accounting for Nature. So I'll be stepping in for Amanda to talk about how to unlock opportunities for Australian landholders through environmental accounting. So who is Accounting for Nature? Um, so we're an Australian not-for-profit organisation and off the back of about 15 years of research by the, by the Wentworth Group of Concerned Scientists, they developed a framework for assessing the condition of environmental assets. And underpinning this framework is a globally recognised standard that measures the condition of the environment. And so as an organisation, Accounting for Nature's mission is to provide a transparent, affordable and verifiable framework. And so this will inform sustainable and regenerative land management, policy making, advocacy and investment decisions. And so we're seeing the environmental space really evolving quite quickly, rapidly. There's um, an increasing awareness of the environment and a growing push for people to really consider the environment and incorporate it into decision making. And so we're seeing a lot of additional emerging frameworks um, and treaties um, and just standards really emerging to support that. And so of interest, um, one of the biggest ones lately is the Task Force for Nature Related Financial Disclosures or the TNFD. And so this framework is really about identifying nature related risks and opportunities and also identifying impacts and assessing basically how a company depends on nature and impacts nature and then disclosing on it. So at the moment, it is a voluntary framework um, and environmental accounting can be used to underpin those disclosures. Similarly, we're seeing things like the Paris Agreement, the IET targets and other treaties that are really spurring the government and the private sector to think about how they want to achieve nature positive outcomes, how they really want to consider the environment in the bigger picture of things. So in the past, there's been you know, such a heavy focus on carbon, but now we're taking it that one step further to really think about the bigger picture um, and, and biodiversity and nature. And so science really underpins all of these concepts. And so to be able to be confident in the claims that are being made, to be able to make accurate disclosures and that sort of thing, we really need to have foundation in science. And so that really helps people understand the disclosures, have faith that they're accurate and not misrepresenting things. And so really avoiding greenwashing. And then also by being scientifically rigorous, this will enable people to actually access the emerging environmental markets again, because there's confidence that it's actually real and true. And so accounting for nature is really built on science. Um, we standardize the science in measuring environmental condition so that any claims that are made can have people can have confidence in. And so what do we actually do as an organization? Well, we actually don't build environmental accounts for people, but we provide the framework for them to do so. And then off the back of that framework, we certify those environmental accounts. So if an environmental account has been developed in accordance with our standard, then that environmental account, the proponent are able to use our Accounting for Nature Trust Mark or our logo. So they can make claims, they can publicly announce that they are measuring the environment and they can disclose the condition of their environment. Underpinning, underpinning the framework is the accreditation of scientific measurement and monitoring methods. And so these methods provide the instructions on how to measure the condition of the environment. And so they are developed for a specific asset and then they are also accredited by our scientific committee. As an organization, we also provide training and accreditation of experts and auditors. And so we have an online training and assessment platform that teaches people about environmental accounting and also how to actually implement it and develop environmental accounts. And so people who are recognized as accredited experts can actually help other people develop environmental accounts. We also provide coaching and assistance so we can help provide high level assistance and guidance in developing environmental accounts but we can also help connect you with a um, accredited expert to help design the account. 
And then finally, we're currently working on developing an online environmental accounting platform, which really will make it as easy as possible for developing environmental accounts. It will reduce the need for spreadsheets because a lot of people have some difficulty with Excel. Um, so it's really just to make it as easy as possible, um, as much automated as possible, utilizing technology where available, um, but always making sure that the data is secure and safe as well. And so underpinning our framework is a metric called the ECONS or the Environmental Condition Index. And this is unique to our framework. Um, it's a really useful metric because it's on a scale of zero to 100. So it's really easy to understand. Zero represents that the asset is completely degraded, whereas 100 represents that the asset is in a undegraded, or what you would often hear, hear referred to as a reference condition or reference state. And so by having the econ score on a scale of zero to 100, that actually allows us to compare the condition of different assets at different locations and at different scales but it does also allow us to aggregate econ scores across scales. So you can get an econ score for a single patch, or you can get an econ score for an entire country. And so having the econs really summarizes all of that complex underlying scientific information that is required to have a comprehensive understanding of environmental condition. And the econ is a really simple way to communicate this and then to also show the change in condition over time. And so under the Accounting for Nature framework, you can develop an econ for any environmental asset. And so we define environmental assets as those sitting within soil, native fauna, marine, freshwater, or native vegetation. And any environmental asset or environmental account can actually be linked to a carbon account. So we actually, we're a bit separate to carbon, but one of the big uses of environmental accounting is verified co-benefits associated with a carbon project. And so underpinning each of these assets is an accredited method or an option of accredited methods. There's often quite a few different ones that are developed to be fit for purpose. And so methods are developed for a specific purpose and for a specific confidence level. And so the confidence levels are designed to really, they're different levels of assessment and different levels of accuracy for different reasons. So a level one assessment, for example, is expected to be 95% accurate. And it's generally required for um, environmental markets. So the Land Restoration Fund in Queensland, for example, is requiring a level one or a level two confidence level. On the other end of the scale, we have a level three method, which is designed to be 80% accurate. And so these methods are sort of an entry point into environmental accounting. They're designed to be rapid assessments, um, quick assessments, um, and they can be used to just gain a general understanding of your property, but can also be used to support green claims, for example. And so they're, they're generally being used, we're seen by a lot of land care farmers as a first step into environmental accounting when they, they see the value in it, but can't fully um, understand the benefits at the moment of going all out for a level one assessment. And so what does an environmental account actually look like? So we've really aligned environmental accounting with financial accounting. And so you'll see in the bottom, we've got what we call an environmental balance sheet, which breaks down our environmental assets into sub assets. And each of the assets and sub assets achieve an econ score. And then we see how that score changes over time, similar to a financial balance sheet. And then importantly, we also want to look at the trend. So we show it graphically. At the moment, we currently have 37 environmental accounts registered with Accounting for Nature, and these are spread out across most of Australia. Bit of a bias on the East Coast, but there's definitely some out the West. Um, and these current projects cover about 600,000 hectares. We do also have an additional 40 plus projects in the pipeline, and these projects will cover an area of over 8 million hectares of Australia. And so you can actually visit our environmental account registry on our website and dig into the details of each of the projects that are registered because it's a public registry. And so uh, one of the big reasons for using environmental accounting is to support ESG claims or just to support higher level environmental reporting and that sort of thing. 
And so as an example, Kilter Rural recently developed an environmental account for three asset classes. So they looked at native vegetation, soil and native fauna. So they looked at birds for native fauna. And they've actually picked out key pieces of their environmental account to include in their environmental, social, social and governance report. Kilter Rural are an impact investment organisation and so their investors are actually demanding that they sort of, they prove that they're not degrading the environment but rather that they're improving it. And so by using an accounting for nature and environmental accounting, that's how they're proving their environmental outcomes to their investors. And so accounting for nature and land care developed a partnership last year in which we would provide training, coaching, and ultimately support environmental claims. And so off the back of this partnership, we've actually completed 28 workshops and trained over 250 landholders in environmental accounting last year. Of those workshops, we have provided support to over 40 farmers to actually help them start developing environmental accounts. So some of those accounts are actually currently registered on our environmental account registry, whereas some of them are still being developed. And some of them are almost in the certified stage as well. So they'll be available soon also. And most of those these landholders who are pursuing environmental accounts are doing it because they want to help support their green claims. And more broadly, they want to inform their management decisions. So they're monitoring their properties in a standardised and consistent way so that in, in 10 or 20 years times, so they'll have a full time series of the same types of data so that they can easily see the changing condition over time. And so I've touched on this a bit earlier, but why actually develop an environmental account? What are they used for? So most commonly at the moment is we're seeing carbon aggregators use environmental accounts to verify their co-benefits. So again, under the Land Restoration Fund, um, proponents are actually achieving a premium price for having verified co-benefits. So in, in addition to the base carbon price, they might be achieving an extra $50, for example, by having an environmental account linked to that carbon project. We're also seeing environmental accounts be used to support um, sustainability claims. So for example, if a proponent is seeking to export their product into Europe, for example, who have more stringent or are introducing more stringent sustainability requirements. An environmental account can be used to support those requirements and to prove and enable access into those markets. And then finally, again, as I've touched on, environmental accounts are really useful to simply monitor and manage your land more efficiently and sustainably by implementing a standardized framework that is that is utilised at least once every five years, which is what we require, but you can do it more frequently. Another benefit is that if you choose to, depending on the method you choose, you can actually learn a lot about your property. And so this is an example from Gundakim Pastoral Company. So they've actually just released their environmental account today. Um, and as part of their projects, they looked at terrestrial mammals. So that involves setting up a bunch of wildlife cameras across the entire grazing property to see what species they actually support. And it was really exciting to see what sort of animals they could, they had within their property. So they've got a bandicoot and a python, a greater glider, pebble mound mouse, rock wallabies and dingoes. Um, this is just a very small subset of all the fauna species, the native fauna species that they were supporting within their property. And you can have a look at that on our website as well as to see what species they have. And so overall, as part of the Accounting for Nature and Land Care Partnership, um, we, we surveyed participants to sort of get an understanding of how they view environmental accounting after they'd been through the workshops. And so over 70% of the participants thought that environmental accounting is or will be very important for their organisation. Similarly, around 70% would recommend other farmers to join the workshop to learn more about environmental accounting. And then finally, before the workshop, many participants had a little understanding of what environmental accounting actually was. So it is quite a relatively new field that is increasing in awareness. And so we did also identify some limiting factors for uptake of environmental accounting practices. 
Um, and this was generally around lack of capacity. So actually implementing an environmental accounting method generally takes a bit, requires a little bit of knowledge and expertise. And so, um, for example, a lot of the methods do require a level of GIS skills to be able to stratify the property down into what we call assessment units or homogenous areas. Um, in addition, lack of capacity could simply be associated with limited resources. So while we do have our AFN accredited experts, there may have not been resources available for landholders to actually afford to hire an accredited expert, for example. However, as part of the package, we were able to sort of fill that void. Another limiting factor was limited incentive amongst wholesale producers. So a lot of producers who were selling directly to a market were really incentivized at the thought of adding the certified label to their packaging, for example, so that consumers could see clearly that there's a certified environmental account associated with that product. They could scan the QR code on the packaging and dig deeper into that environmental account when making a choice of what to purchase, for example. And then finally, there was a limited understanding of environmental accounting. Again, it's a very new field um, and people are still learning about what it is and why it's useful. So we have identified some barriers that can be overcome to help incentivize environmental accounting. So if producer groups and wholesale groups were to sort of recognize and incentivize the importance of environmental accounting and sort of not necessarily introduce it as a requirement, but just sort of increase awareness around it and then ultimately communicate that with the, with the end users. Also the creation of more methods. At the moment, Accounting for Nature currently has 19 accredited methods. However, we're finding that some of these methods that have been used aren't necessarily perfectly fit for purpose for a given property. And so as a result, we're always um, willing to accredit and review new methods, or there is also an option to amend existing methods. So you can tweak an existing method to be a bit more suited to your specific circumstances. As part of the land care program, we are also looking at establishing benchmarks for industries and regions to be compared against. However, that's really reliant on getting as many environmental accounts as possible for a particular region or for a particular industry. And so by doing so, a landholder can potentially see where they're sitting compared to the average within that industry or region. And then finally, we need to improve support in the form of skilling people up to um, be knowledgeable in environmental accounting and also establishing more grants to assist with implementation. Because one of the biggest hurdles in developing an environmental account is actually designing it. Um, but then also there is a cost associated with going out and collecting data. And so that's where Accounting for Nature is really working on our tech platform, where we're looking at technologies and ways to make it as cheap and easy as possible. Our ultimate long-term goal is for people to be able to develop a fully scientifically rigorous and accurate environmental account at the click of a button. Um, that would have amazing environmental outcomes and everyone would be considering the environment and their decision-making. And that's that. Thank you so much. I think I'm running a little bit ahead of time. Um, I'm not sure, Chrissy. I'm wave if you can hear me. I can hear you. Good. Okay, well, that's good. Um, so we have a few minutes for questions. So perhaps would someone like to fire up with the first one? There you go, Rob Yule. So, Chrissy, what's the small? What? Wait, 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 Rob. Wait to the microphone because no one outside can hear. <laughs> Sorry, Chrissy. That was very extremely interesting and very well presented. What's the smallest property you would consider looking at? Uh, um, that's a good question. We don't actually have any specific scale like thresholds. We do break scales down into categories. So we've got a regional scale, a property scale, and then also a project scale, which can generally be a subset of a property. Um, that being said, the smallest property or area that could be assessed, it would really be dependent on the method, for example. Um, so I'm hazarding a guess one hectare, but again, 
really depends on the method and how it's designed. Wait, wait to the microphone. There we go. I appreciate your interest. Thank you. Uh, hi there. Uh, question. Um, you're using uh, your own proprietary accounting methods or standards and methods. How do they align with the Australian Environmental Accounting Standard? Um, so it is aligned. So I believe the Instra Australian Environmental Accounting Standard, I believe you might be referring to the UN, or it is aligned with the UN SEER. And so we are fully aligned with the UN SEER. Um, is that? Yes, that, yep. was a, that was a yes, thank you. Okay, perfect, perfect, yes. We are fully aligned with the UN SEER. Any more? Oh. I'm gonna, hang on, we're gonna skip Rob, we'll give someone else a go, you next. Sorry, Rob, we've got to be fair. We, we respect your status, Rob. We'll get to you. Don't you I'm worry. I'm sure yours we is will. much more interesting, Rob. We'll get to you. No, no, no. Um, so a concern I get from landholders a lot with any of these kinds of programs is a fear of what you'll find and a fear yeah. that finding an endangered species or a, her um, a cultural item might inhibit their choices into the future. So I was wondering if you come across that concern and what your advice to landholders is if you do come across that concern. Absolutely. Um, it's a concern we actually haven't heard brought up that often recently. And I'm hoping that's because there's a shift that if, if people find an endangered animal on their property, that should be celebrated rather than feared. And I think that is a very slow shift in thinking is that with the emergence of environmental markets and that sort of thing, um, hopefully, if someone is measuring their property and they're finding a threatened species, then there'll actually be incentives for them to protect the species rather than for there being concerns long term about what they could do with that area. So it's just a bit of a shift in thinking for everyone. Um, but that being said, our framework really just presents an objective fact of what the condition is. And then it's up to the market to sort of interpret that fact. Um, and also up to the proponent to communicate that uh, the results as well. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Rob. Well, thanks again, Chrissy. It occurred to me that if you were looking for support in the region, some of the uh, field naturalist groups are, j are just full of extremely experienced and uh, knowledgeable people. Uh, and, and also the CMAs, you know, the regional NRM bodies, and I was just wondering, uh, thinking about a, a park development project uh, in the next municipality to me in Melbourne, uh, could this be extended to, say, municipal land care projects? So you're, you're looking into sort of, uh, you know, park spaces to help uh, municipalities develop their environmental credentials. Yeah, exactly. We haven't seen any... There hasn't been much movement in that space recently, except we are actually looking at ways to incorporate the environmental accounting framework into urban areas, for example. So councils using it for their parks or natural areas. We'd love to see that, absolutely. Um, on your point about the CMA or NRM groups, we are actually um, talking with a lot of NRM groups about how to actually implement it all at the regional scale as well. So it's really quite exciting in that space. Another question here. Do we? You're monitoring the online, are you, Ben? Yeah, we haven't got any come through online. So, if anyone online has a burning urge for a question, send it in. It may be that you are, and we can't work out how the tech works, but um, give it. <laughs> keep, keep going. Um, yeah, I was just interested. How big is the market for tradable credits, and also for carbon credits with biodiversity offsets? Oh, sorry, with um, biodiversity attached to it. And are they just in Australia, or are you talking about internationally? trading internationally as well? Yeah, absolutely. So at the moment, there's actually no um, environmental or biodiversity credits as a standalone credit that we're aware of. Um, the biggest, I guess, market mechanism for recognising this is the co-benefits associated with a carbon project. And so Australia is actually really quite pioneering in that space. Um, I've mentioned before the Queensland Land Restoration Fund, who have really recognised that as a government framework. However, we are also working on ways to, um, for anyone to link an environmental account with any carbon scheme. And so that could be done anywhere in the world. Um, 
Accounting for Nature is started as an Australian company, but we are expanding globally. I just a quick comment to make on that is probably the distinction between the Accounting for Nature framework and, for example, the biodiversity offset framework that exists in New South Wales. So in New South Wales, the BCT operates uh, a biodiversity credit system, but that is purely designed at offsetting um, clearing from development, not about generating um, an economic value on top of you know a, a piece of a, a piece of biodiversity. We've got uh, a question down here from Pamela. Thank you. Good point, by the way. Chrissy, thank you. Um, I see that quite a lot of the dots are in Queensland and I'm presuming that most of them are probably projects funded by the Land Restoration Fund. I'm wondering whether, given that the management of Queensland's national parks also happens out of the same government department, whether you've had any conversations with the national parks about um, assessing the... Um, land condition of the national parks and whether in fact the management of those land holdings, um, what, what, what movement um, is occurring in, in those considerable land holdings? It's a great question. We'd love to see national parks um, adopt the framework. Uh, it would be very interesting to see because I know Quite a few parks have a few weed infestations and invasive animals and that sort of thing. Um, however, to my knowledge, I'm, I'm not familiar with the conversations that have been had or if there have been any conversations had with parks at this point. Um, I imagine there probably would have been. I might just not be aware of them. I'm going to use the chair's prerogative here to ask a question myself, if that's OK, Chrissy. Cool. Uh, my first exposure to accounting for nature methods was through the land restoration fund in the Queensland rangelands. Uh, and you, you identified a few barriers to uptake, and I have to say, in that context, <laughs> cost was a major problem for us. To, the, the cost of you know, demonstrating a shift from this many econs to that many econs was, was very substantial. And I just wonder, in the, even the you know, three or four years since I last looked at it, um, whether you've made any progress in response to that. Absolutely. Um, so we have recently accredited a new method that was designed for that very reason. Um, the proponents were looking to use the land restoration fund vegetation method on large rangeland properties, but it just was not feasible whatsoever to meet the requirements of the method. And so this new method was developed by Bush Heritage and Climate Friendly. Um, and it used, utilizes uh, drones essentially and field teams to do what they call as an integrated vegetation assessment. So the drones are doing what they do best, um, automated flyovers, canopy cover, canopy height, that sort of thing. Um, and the field teams are doing targeted surveys for species richness. And so that's one way that we're looking at technology to make methods easier to implement, especially over really large uh, project areas. Well, that's good to hear. Yeah. One last question from up the back. Oh, sorry, I saw that hand before I saw your hand. Right, thanks. <laughs> Mine's kind of uh, double barreled. Oh, could you... <laughs> <laughs> but both quick. Uh, just could you give us an idea of the size of your organisation, how many employees you've got, just to have a sense of that? And <laughs> then, secondly, when you do these accounts, do you have anyone who says, I want you to do this account, but I don't want it to be publicly available, that it's uh, about privacy issues. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, so first, on the size of the organisation, we're actually really small. We've only got five full-time employees. I hope I got that number right. Um, but we've got a really wonderful and active board. So I think we've got more board members than we have um, employees. And you can check out our board members and employees on the website. And then secondly, on your question of wanting a private account, we do actually have provisions for a private account. However, there are limitations on the claims and communication that can be made around that account. And so if you do opt to have a private account, you can't make any public claims because we're all about transparency. And so if you're making claims, green claims, um, claims around sustainability, we want people to be able to dig deeper. So going to that environmental account registry page, reading the information statement and doing their own due diligence. But that being said, if they do choose a private account, 
um, then there is there are provisions for sort of peer peer to peer uh, communication, so sharing. So, for example, um, if you're wanting to share it with your bank, for example, um, that would be an option. Uh, that being said, in our registry, there are also there is also the option to not disclose your location, so not showing any maps associated with the account. So there are some flexibilities and some options in there around privacy. Look, thanks, Chrissy. Uh, we have run out of time now. I, I think though those of you that have been here to see Chrissy's presentation will be as impressed as I am as someone who has uh, stepped in at the, the last <laughs> minute and you know, filled the breach. Uh, that was a, an you. excellent presentation and, and let's uh, have a big thank you for Chrissy. <laughs>